and there we go got it <laughs> and uh john uh whenever you're ready then thank you and and um can i share my screen has that been enabled Wonderful, wonderful. Well, um, where to begin? Uh, Anglicans treasure eccentric clergy, we all know that, and eccentric Anglo-Catholic clergy are the stuff of legend, but I doubt that any of them, any of them could um, rival this, and I hope this pops up, yes? All right, there we are. We have a priest conducting an orchestra in his alb. Even Jeffrey Smith, um, <laughs> who knows everything there is to know about such things, tells me he has never, never in his life seen anything quite like this. Now, those of you, um, who read the e-blast today know who this is. This is the Reverend John Putterell, Father Jack to his parishioners, for 30 years the uh, vicar of the village of Thaxted. And in fact, Father Jack was, was a gifted musician. He was a fine double bass player. Um, he studied composition with Gustav Holst. Um, and in fact, the mass setting that the choir will sing this Sunday is a work of his. Um, and conducting orchestras in an alb was only one of his eccentricities. Here's yet another. There he is um, at the Vicarage Planetarium. He was an extraordinarily skilled amateur astronomer, so I'm told, and he would wander around the village with a telescope in his cassock not merely uh, looking at the heavens, but also looking at this. Father Richard talked about uh, the beauty of the village of Thaxted, and there it is. It is a picture perfect English village. And what Father Jack would do is not simply um, look at this scene for the beauty, but he would especially focus his telescope on the fabric of the church, a church dedicated to Our Lady, St. John the Baptist and St. Lawrence, looking for damage done by the notorious Death Watch Beetle, an insect that can be quite as uh, dangerous, quite as ferocious in its appetite, devouring the church timbers <laughs> as any termite. And by the way, one of the things about the uh, Death Watch Beetle, I learned, is that it gets its name from its peculiar clicking sound. One way to know that your church is infected with the Death Watch Beetle is to wander through the church and knock on the walls and wait. And if you hear a telltale click in response, you know that there's danger ahead. Father Jack was very eccentric. And as if this were not enough, he was also someone with left-wing views. And let me qualify that by saying very, very, very left-wing views. And so many years ago when Elizabeth and I visited Thaxted uh, and went to his church that Sunday morning, we went prepared for the unusual. Um, it turned out we weren't prepared enough because Father Jack got into the pulpit and after giving the usual Trinitarian invocation, he said in a very plummy, almost BBC accent, the subject of my sermon this morning is the Blessed Virgin Mary, prophet of anti-imperialism. I looked around, I looked at the congregation, no one batted an eye, and I thought, has Father Jack gone mad? Had the whole congregation 
gone mad. Where in the world did this come from? But of course, I knew something of the history of Thaxted, and so an answer immediately came to mind. He got it from his predecessor. For this bucolic parish, before Father Jack had been its vicar, had been under the care of Father Jack's father-in-law, Conrad Noel, the founder of the Catholic Crusade. This, by the way, a painting that's found in the Guild Hall of Thaxted. The Catholic Crusade, or to give it its full name, the Catholic Crusade of the Servants of the Most Precious Blood. A tiny group that never numbered more than 200 members, and yet in its manifesto, it promised to break up the present world order and make anew in the power of the outlaw of Galilee and to shatter the British Empire and all empires to bits. And Christopher, uh, the Catholic Crusade Manifesto is something you might consider republishing. Um, it's certainly not under copyright any longer. Now for Noel and for his fellow crusaders, the Blessed Virgin Mary was a patron and an inspiration. Noel described her this way. Mother of God and mother of man, who rejoices that her son is casting down the mighty from their thrones and exalting them of low degree. The woman clothed with the sun, with the world at her feet and the serpent under them. Well then, if all of this goes deep in the history of Thaxted, was there something wrong about Thaxted? Was there something in the drinking water? Um, or perhaps, perhaps there was something about Essex, the county in which um, Thaxted is located, because I think as Father Richard and Jennifer can testify, Essex does have a reputation for all sorts of things, and we could probably do a, a forum about the county of Essex alone. But then, but then something comes to mind something we just did. That canticle on the top of page 65 of the prayer book, what we recite every evening. The language of Our Lady's song is as radical as it could be. Now I know you could say, uh, no one takes this literally, do they? No one, no one applies this to our current situation, do they? I mean, when we, we have a shrine of Our Lady, don't we? And I've never noticed anyone reverencing that shrine by raising their fist to salute Comrade Mary. Were they missing something at Thaxted? Or could it be that we're missing something? Because these Marian devotions at Thaxted are in fact part and parcel of a radical strand that is deeply woven into the fabric of Anglo-Catholicism. And it's a strand that, that joins together sacrament and society, joy and justice, revelation and revolution. And what I wanna do um, this evening is to follow that strand. Um, to place Father Jack's sermon, to place the Catholic crusade in a broader context by looking at two other sermons about the Blessed Virgin Mary. No, 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 I'll make that no. Two and a half other sermons about the Blessed Virgin Mary and then return to Thaxted and ponder what all of this might mean for us. So let's go back a little ways. Uh, to the last quarter of the 19th century, what we might call the heroic age of the Catholic revival in the Church of England, uh, the age of those slum clergy who defied their bishops and risked imprisonment to serve their destitute congregations and to share with them uh, the grace of sacramental worship. Now, these clergy, like the lay people and religious who joined them, were a courageous lot and an unusual lot. 
And this is certainly true of our first preacher, someone Conrad Noel much admired, a man named Thomas Hancock, uh, and a man who is today virtually forgotten. Now, at first sight, uh, Thomas Hancock and Conrad Noel would seem to have almost nothing in common. Noel, and I think this, this portrait captures some of it, Noel was flamboyant and he allied himself with all sorts of secular radicals, including for a time, uh, a rather uncomfortable alliance with the Communist Party, uh, something that Father Jack was also engaged in. Uh, there's a story, by the way, about Father Jack uh, giving, giving a sermon and someone had come in late and asked the woman sitting in front of her What's he talking about? And she said, he's talking about Russia. And her husband said, he's always talking about Russia. Uh, Hancock. Hancock had none of this flamboyance. He was reserved to a fault. If there was a photograph of Thomas Hancock, I haven't found it and nobody else seems to have found it either. He loathed popularity. He loathed advertising. He loathed what he called, I love this, the cult of Barnum-like bigness. And as for political parties, he didn't like any of them. He mistrusted all of them. In his eyes, political parties um, offered nostrums. They, offered, they were selling patent medicine when all the suffering world really needed was the kingdom of God. And it was the church's task, the church's task to reveal the kingdom. But Hancock was not happy with the church either because he complained the church had succumbed to the same tired nostrums being peddled by the secular world. Vision, he said, had given way to management, to what he called, and I love this, uh, he said, the church has, give, has yielded to an utterly preposterous faith in organization. And Hancock was particularly appalled by the apostles of church growth. The kingdom of God, he said, grows like a mustard seed. The church growth industry thinks it grows like the most prodigious fungus. Imagine what he would have made of our strategic plans our surveys, all of the endless meetings that we endure. Imagine what our church authorities would have made of him. We know what the church authorities of his own day made of him, uh, because for many years, he had to eke out a living writing book reviews. It wasn't until the end of the 19th century Nicholas Cole Abbey, a man named Henry Carey Shuttleworth, um, offered him a lectureship there. So Hancock doesn't seem like the sort of person who would hold up the Blessed Virgin Mary as a prophet for some kind of radical agenda. But he did. He did. And he did so not out of some political principle, but from a threefold theological conviction in first the reality of the incarnation second the mission of the church and third the advent of the kingdom of god because well think back two weeks ago think back when father richard led us through the genealogy of jesus as recorded in the gospel of luke jesus there Jesus there is presented not simply as the son of Abraham, but as the son of Adam and the son of God. And therefore, says Hancock, he is the son of humanity. In him, all human beings, all human beings, partake of the divine nature. And they partake of this divine nature in perfect equality. And so said Hancock, 
the church must always take the side of the scorned and the hatred and the hated, whoever they may be. And after all, the church is the body of Christ. And if Christ is the head of all humanity, then the church is the destined home of every man and woman. It is their birthright. And so the church must be both democratic and egalitarian. And finally, as the church enters the reality of this divine humanity, it will more and more reveal the mystery of the kingdom, the divine commonwealth established at the foundation of the world. Now, Hancock, as I said, was no political ideologue. But in the 1880s, socialist demonstrations were making their way across London. Formerly quiet streets were now filled, filled with the unemployed, filled with socialist agitators. And all of this, Hancock saw the hand of God at work. And nowhere was this more obvious, he believed, than an extraordinary day in 1880 of London and descended on St. Paul's Cathedral, carrying banners that read, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And more simply and directly, feed my sheep. Now, Hancock was under no illusion that these demonstrators were churchgoers or Christians of any sort. But that didn't change the fact, he said, that the banner of Christ was in the hands of the socialists. And it is this conviction that inspired his tribute to the Blessed Virgin Mary, a sermon on the Magnificat that equals anything Father Jack would say, a sermon that he titled the Hymn of Universal Social Revolution. And he said, and these are his words, he said, every nation has what is called its national hymn. But the Magnificat is the hymn of all peoples. It is the hymn of humanity, the hymn of all parishes. Every so-called national hymn has war, competition, the murderous destruction or crippling of sister nation that's as its motive. While the Magnificat has as its motive the scattering by God's son of those classes in every nation which make wars, which thrive by them, which stir up unbrotherly hatred and competition between people and people. God, he said, God is always at war with the proud the mighty and the rich on behalf of the humble, the meek and the hungry. On their behalf, fight the invisible armies of the incarnate word of God. And then Hancock noted the Pope, this was Leo XIII, the Pope had recently described Mary as the great foe of socialism. And he mischievously noted if the Magnificat be her song, it would be far more reasonable to call her the mother of it. Father Jack and Conrad Noel were in good company, it seems. And they were not alone. Now, we, we don't have a photo of Thomas Hancock, but we do have a sketch of the church where he preached his sermon. And it is a church that no one, no one here, and probably virtually no one living has ever seen. It is the church of St. Mary the Virgin Soho, once located on Charing Cross Road, a church that was torn down, I think in 1935 or around that time, when the parish was merged with St. Anne Soho. Ironically, a few years later, the Church of St. Anne Soho was obliterated during the Blitz. Uh, so we, we, we know something about the church and we also know something else. We know to whom Hancock preached this sermon. 
and it was not the usual Sunday congregation. It was a meeting of the Guild of St. Matthew, an Anglo-Catholic socialist society that more than any other, I think, wove that radical strand that we've been studying into the fabric of our faith. And the founder of the Guild of St. Matthew, as many of you know, was this man, Stuart Hedlum. Now, I've written a wonderful book about Stuart Hedlum that everyone ought to buy. I don't mean that everybody ought to read it. Buying it will suffice. Um, and so there's no need for me to chronicle his career except to say that he was dismissed from every curacy he ever held. He was dismissed for preaching the doctrine of universal salvation, dismissed for defending the dignity of the music hall, uh, where dancers cavorted in flesh-colored tights. He was dismissed for befriending atheists. And then he was dismissed for presiding at a rally that demanded the abolition of the House of Lords. And at every step along the way, his devotion to the Catholic faith and the Blessed Virgin Mary only deepened. Uh, there's a story that when the Evangelical Bishop of London, someone, uh, Father Richard knows, we, we both have a, an illustration of him, of him um, on our walls, a man named John Jackson. Uh, when Bishop Jackson asked one of Hedlund's vicars, um, if Hedlund believed in our Lord's divinity, the vicar replied, of course he does. And I think he believes in the divinity of Our Lady also. And it must have been this devotion to Mary that inspired what is now an Anglo-Catholic shrine church, a St. Mary's Bourne Street, to invite Hedlam to deliver a sermon on the cultus of Our Lady. Now, before we go any further, it's worth pointing out that the church, when it opened, um, was much simpler than it is today. It was a cavernous place. It was built very quickly um, as a, and as cheaply as possible as a mission church for the poor of Pimlico. Um, it was only later that it was adorned with beautiful shrines like this. Now, Hedlam began his sermon in good Victorian Anglo-Catholic fashion with a summons. He said, it is to this generation that is entrusted the glorious task of restoring to the English church a real reverence for the Blessed Virgin Mary, to speak to her, confess to her, and ask her to speak for us. But what Hedlam meant by this probably startled some of the congregation. He said, by reminding us of the incarnation, Mary teaches us to honor our own humanity in all its fullness, body, mind, and spirit. Mary reminds us to labor for the good of humanity, to struggle against inequality in wealth and esteem, to honor those who labor for us, to labor with them for the common good. And the church is the divinely appointed society for changing the world in the image of the Blessed Virgin Mary. She is the patron, the patron of this new world, but she is more than that. This is particularly interesting. I'm thinking here of uh, Christopher's talk to us last week. Hedlam said, Mary is the model of women's emancipation. To honor Mary is to honor women, and not by offering some kind of sham chivalry, but by granting them an equal education, an equal opportunity to work, by giving them the right to vote, by eliminating, and these are his words, every remnant of law or custom that treats them as men's chattels. And this is a sign of Anglo-Catholic history of which we can be justly proud, but one, one that demands much more attention 
that has been tragically ignored. And I'm very glad that we are in the midst of reevaluating that heritage. But there's even more, said Hedlam, to our devotion to Mary than this. He said, look, look at the story of the wedding feast at Cana. What did Mary ask her son to do? Turn water into merry making wine. Mary enables us, said Hedlam, to see Christ as the font of life and joy, the inspirer of mirth, the maker of beauty. Joy and justice drawn together as they would be for Conrad Noel and Father Jack, um, which does bring to mind two stories. First, a Thaxted story. Um, the story is that Conrad Noel was giving a sermon and he cited some father of the church, some Greek father who said that in the kingdom of God, there will be a thousand vines and each vine will have a thousand branches and each branch will have a thousand grapes and each grape will yield a thousand barrels of wine. And Noel looked up and smiled and said, now there's a kingdom for you. Uh, the other is uh, a story about Hedlam that you may be familiar to some of you, but it bears repeating. Uh, after he had given a lecture praising the virtues of the music hall, someone in the audience who took offense um, asked him um, if he thought St. Paul would have frequented such a place, to which Hedlam replied, I do not know if St. Paul would have gone to a music hall, but I know our Lord would have gone and taken his blessed mother with him. Sacraments and society, joy and justice, revelation and revolution, a remarkable Anglo-Catholic trinity. But uh, do we really need to make them our own? After all, there are other ways to envision um, um, the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so we come to our half sermon. And I call it a half sermon uh, because, well, first, I've heard it only secondhand. And secondly, because, excuse me while I look for something I seem to have mislaid. I have mislaid it. Um, hold on. I have a poem to recite of all things, and I don't see it. Well, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, um, now I've, I've, I've lost my place altogether. Oh, yes, we had, we had that, that half sermon. Um, is a story told to me by a friend, and also the sermon was somewhat half-baked. Our friend was conducting a retreat at a mainline Philadelphia parish, a wealthy parish, and um, gone very well. And that Sunday was the feast of the visitation where uh, the uh, Magnificat is part of the gospel lesson. Now, this was the late 1960s, um, a very, turbulent time, and the congregation was, to say the least, nervous about what their rector might say about this passage. And uh, the rector got up, and they became even more nervous when he slowly repeated the words, he hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. The congregation looked up. And then the rector spoke. We are, he said, all of us spiritually hungry. And you could hear an audible sigh of relief. Of course, of course, this applies to us there's nothing demanded of us. We are safe and secure, which brings to mind the 
poem I was looking for. And what I'm going to do for a moment is I'm going to stop the share and instead I am going to find this poem because I was looking at it just a short while ago. And I'm going to recite the first stanza of it, all right? Here we go. Robert of Sicily, brother of Pope Urbane, and Valamond, emperor of Alamein, appareled in magnificent attire, with retinue of many a knight and squire on St. John's Eve at Vespers sat and heard the priest chant the Magnificat. And as he listened o'er and o'er again, repeated like a burden or refrain, he caught the words, despasuit potentes de sede et exaltavit humiles. And slowly lifting up his kingly head, he to a learned clerk beside him said, what mean these words? The clerk made answer meet. He has put down the mighty from their seat and has exalted them of low degree. Thereat King Robert muttered scornfully, tis well that such seditious words are sung only by priests and in the Latin tongue. For unto priests and people be it known there is no power can push me from my throne. And leaning back, he yawned and fell asleep, lulled by the chant, monotonous and deep. So, so here is the question. Here is the question. Who had lost his mind? Who had lost his mind? Father Jack, or this mainline Philadelphia rector. Now, I want to be careful about this uh, because this is not, to my mind, a political question. Um, it's not about whether you call yourself a libertarian or a socialist a progressive, a centrist, a conservative, or whether you say a pox on all their houses, none of the above. The question really is this. And let's see if I can do this all right. Hmm. The technology is challenging here. Ah, here we go. Here we are. When you look at this woman, what do you see? Or to put it another way, when you look at this woman, what do you seek? What are you looking for? And this brings us back to Thaxted. A few years before he died, a Conrad Noel completed a lengthy book, a study of the life of Jesus. It is an idiosyncratic volume to say the least, even by the standards of its own day, the biblical scholarship was, let's say, peculiar. And there are parts of this book that are, well, rather tangentious, and yet, and yet there are flashes of extraordinary insight. And none is more relevant for us this evening than what Noel has to say about this scene. You all recognize it, I hope. This is, this is the presentation of the infant Jesus in the temple in Jerusalem. Mary and Joseph have brought Jesus to the temple and somehow in the hubbub and confusion of that vast place, 
Anna and Simeon recognize that this child is the longed for Messiah. Wonderful painting by Rembrandt. Uh, Simeon then, as you see in the painting, Simeon takes the child in his arms and gives thanks. In this extraordinary prayer we find on the top of page 66 every evening, or at least this is how we imagine it. But Noel, Noel asks us to look at something we're apt to miss. And that is that Anna and Simeon, we are told, were looking for something. They weren't just wandering around, they were looking for something. They were looking for the consolation or the redemption of Israel. And Noah wants us to imagine that in addition to the Sadducees and the Fadducees, Sadducees, Pharisees and the Essenes and the Zealots with which we are familiar, there was another group within the Jewish world of that time, a group that he calls the Redemptionists. They weren't Roman collaborators like the Sadducees. They weren't legal scholars like the Pharisees. They weren't otherworldly monastics like the Essenes, and they weren't violent nationalists like the Zealots. They were men and women looking for nothing less than the kingdom of God. Anna and Simeon, says Noel, were surely among their number, as were Zechariah and Elizabeth, as were Mary and Joseph. And so this encounter in the temple is no surprise, it's no happenstance. Anna and Simeon knew Mary. They knew Joseph. They knew the depth of her yearning. And so they knew her son. Seek and ye shall find. Now, the Sunday that Elizabeth and I were, were in Thaxton, uh, we were joined by a friend, a, a doctoral student at Union Theological Seminary. Uh, she was not an Anglican, certainly not an Anglo-Catholic. She was a member of something called the Evangelical Covenant Church, um, a small offshoot of the Lutheran Church of Sweden. Marian devotions were not part of her spiritual life. And she was not given to the kind of bombastic politics that uh, Father Jack espoused. Now the service ended with the Angelus. And I kept looking over, wondering, wondering what our friend would make of it. And there she was on her knees praying, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners hour at, uh, at the hour of our, for, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. And afterwards, I, I turned to her and I said, Gina said, what, what, why? And she said, I'm not sure, she said, but I know what these people mean by that prayer, and I mean the same thing. So perhaps the question ultimately is this, do we, do you and I, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all very much. I've said more than my share. And um, I think that the room is open for questions, comments, <coughs> denunciations. Yeah, Jennifer. Yes, 
um, you mentioned that he was um, criticized for attending music halls and maybe we need to just explain a little bit more about the music hall. The music hall was not quite a vaudeville show. It was uh, the poor man's entertainment. It started off with people simply getting up on the tables of an eating hall, but many of the music hall songs were about their hard life, such as the baby has gone down the plug hole, the <laughs> baby has gone down the drain, but it's because the baby was so small or um, it's the rich that gets the pleasure, it's the poor that gets the blame. Mm -hmm. Or she was only, a, a, you know, she was a gilded cage. And then there's a, a poem called Damn Your Eyes, which is about, which I have actually had someone do in one of the musicals I directed, which is about this man who's on his way um, to the guillotine, basically, or well, to be hung, sorry. Um, so that for a priest to attend a music hall and condone what they were doing, which was a way of the people complaining about their lives is I think very interesting. Oh yes, and are there, are there all sorts of other things one could say. The, 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 the beer flowed freely in the music hall. Um, in the great music halls, not so much actually in the music halls um, frequented by the working classes, but in the great music halls like the Empire and the Alhambra, um, courtesans plied their way wares in the, in the lobby. Um, and it's interesting that um, when, when Hedlum was, was asked about all of this, um, he said, um, well, he said, yes, he said, um, some naughty things do go on, but look at those women so bright and cheerful. Would that all young ladies could be as bright and cheerful as those entertainers on the stage? And I have to tell you something, um, and that is that uh, Jennifer has uh, talked from time to time about um, putting on a kind of music hall evening <laughs> at St. Paul's. Oh, um, so the scandal goes on. Uh, <laughs> I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Um, by the way, it should be noted by the way, that even, even the, the legitimate stage was regarded with some suspicion in proper church circles. Um, it was said that it might be all right for church goers to for church goers to attend a play, let's say something by Shakespeare, but it would not be seemly for a clergyman to be seen attending the theater. So what Hedlund was doing was really, really quite daring. Actually, weren't many of our parishes the sole stages of neighborhoods at one time? Many have uh, stages and were used for productions of all kinds. Yes, I, that's true. And it would be, you know, we've talked we played with the idea, haven't we, of uh, being on some some kind of, of theatrical thing at 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 St. Paul's. I think it would be an interesting thing to 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 do. The church. Oh, that, no, sorry, go go ahead, Catherine. No, I was just going to say uh, in the nineteen twenties, thirties, the then. Um, Dean, well, the then, it's in the 30s, the then, then Dean of the Cathedral, Canterbury Cathedral, um, thought that the cathedral should be a showcase for the, um, the arts of the places. And that's how you got T.S. Eliot in 1935, writing Murder in the Cathedral and uh, Dorothy L. Sayers in, 1937, um, writing the greatest story ever told. Um, Robert Richard has said I should talk about Dorothy L. Sayers at some point, but the, the point is, um, yes, 
uh, Tina stage and um, why not? <laughs> I didn't mean to get away from the main thing, your main subject, John. Well, I like the idea of um, Mary as the great subversive. Um, she only speaks four times in the Gospels. Four times. But, um, you know, you have the Magnificat. You have her, the, the unsaid thing at the wedding of Cana and John. Like, uh, all she says to Jesus is they have no wine. And he says, it is not my time. And... And I think of this thing in the background that's not recorded, um, like, who you? Talk back to me and your dad when you got lost in the temple and we were looking for you and you said, I gotta be about my father's business. Well, hey, this is the time, do your thing. Um, yeah. Anyway, yeah, <laughs> sorry. No. So, do you think Hulse was inspired by uh, the various uh, uh, vicars of that church or that church? Oh, don't, well, most certainly. I mean, he and Noah were, were close friends. Um, um, Hulse shared, I think, the same fundamental political outlook. Um, Hulse organized um, music festivals at Thaxton. And well beyond uh, Conrad Noel's day, um, it, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, the London Philharmonic would come to Thaxted uh, to, to play. Uh, so I, so, so yeah, holes and and it's interesting. I, I sh Jeffrey is, is isn't here, so I hope he he, he won't mind. Um, uh, on Sunday we're going to be singing um, "I Vow to Thee, My Country," Yay! which is sent. <laughs> which is set to the tune called Thaxted, composed in Thaxted, but Gustav Holst and Conrad Noel hated the lyrics, absolutely hated the lyrics, uh, thought they were too otherworldly, too nationalistic, too patriotic, um, and there were alternative lyrics written emphasizing social justice, um, I sent them to Jeffrey, but he decided not to use them. Um, <laughs> John, could you say something about um, Conrad Knoll and the IRA and Conrad Knoll and benediction? Well, Conrad Knoll, during, during the First World War, um, uh, the story I've told before, during the First World War, uh, which Knoll supported, um, Noel, like a good many other uh, people on the left of the Church of England, saw uh, the First World War as a struggle against Prussian imperialism. Uh, Noel put in the church the flags of the nations fighting against Germany and Austria. And when uh, the Irish Rebellion began, he added the Sinn Féin flag and then hung over uh, the chancel a red banner that read, he has made of all, of all nations of one blood. And in the aftermath, there was this on again, off again struggle. Um, people would come in, especially undergraduates from Cambridge and steal the flags. And then Noel would come in and put them back up again. And eventually this went to an ecclesiastical court. And this is one wonderful moment when the chancellor of the diocese of Chelmsford said, said, why not take down the flags? You'll get on so much better if you do. And Noel said, I do not want to get on I want to preach the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> as, 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 for, as for Corpus Christi, um, 
know all. Uh, this, this was an extraordinary controversial thing to do at the time. And uh, Noel did, in fact, a short procession of the sacrament from the vicarage to the church. And the bishop, bishop was just beside himself and told Noel, this is not to be done again. Uh, but Noel, in response, did another procession, this on Corpus Christi Day, with a procession running through the town, <laughs> announced ahead of time with an advert in the Church Times and elsewhere, saying, essentially this saying, Jesus Christ, the divine outlaw of Galilee, will appear in the bread of the working people of Thaxted Church. All those who wish to join him in his struggle are welcome. Mere onlookers are not. <laughs> there followed a riot. <laughs> um, um, Noel's life was threatened. H.G. Wells drove up to Thaxted um, um, and um, said, with, and, with, you know, and offered Noel, said, come into my car. This isn't safe for you, but Noel and his wife insisted on staying in the vicarage. And eventually, uh, you know, he, the, he was ordered to take down the flags and, and two things followed. Uh, first, um, as someone in the parish said, the flags have, done, have come down, but the preaching will go on. And Noel was summoned to a meeting with the bishop. And the bishop, again, asked Noel, you have to promise me you're not going to do this. And Noel said to him, my Lord, do you believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the sacrament? And the bishop, who was a, a well-meaning evangelical, said, no. He said, well, then, then you cannot regulate the practice of people who do. And it was obviously going nowhere. And, and the bishop, bishop tried to salvage, salvage the meeting by saying, well, would, would, would you stay for lunch? And Noel said, I cannot sit at the table of a heretic. <laughs> <laughs> and walked out and the bishop placed the parish under an interdict no child would be confirmed in the parish until Noel gave way and Noel would not and it was only after the bishop had I think he, he may have died uh, that his, his replacement was more understanding and relented. You know, we, 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 we forget, we forget that these, these men were really um, not only courageous, but sometimes outrageous. Um, and it is this rare, this rare combination of, of sanctity and eccentricity that really makes them uh, um, such inspiring figures. There are lots of uh, present company um, accepted, because I see my, my wife here too. Um, uh, there are lots of crazy clerics. Um, um, but there is an art to being both crazy and holy. And that is what I think Conrad Noel had mastered. And what's interesting is, is this, um, when Noel died, it was by no means certain that Jack Putterell would be his successor. Um, but the parochial council and anyone who was baptized was in member of the parochial council. And this was a community. 
that again and again and again sent conservative MPs to parliament. Right? They voted overwhelmingly, we want another priest like Conrad Noel. Huh. This is who we want. And Jack Putterall, Jack Putterall um, married Conrad Noel's daughter and she remained on the parochial council for something like longer than Putterall was vicar. I mean, it is an extraordinary thing. And well, one other little, little tidbit, which I think I've shared before, but it, it's, it's funny. And that is um, when Noel died, um, uh, of course, this, this funeral mass and the bishop came and the bishop preached a really remarkable tribute to Conrad Noel. And Noel's grave was marked with the inscription, he loved justice and hated oppression. Hmm. A few years later, his wife Miriam died. She was buried there too. The inscription now reads, Conrad Noel, the dates. He loved justice and hated impression and hated oppression. Also his wife Miriam. <laughs> 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 it's, it's interesting, John, how things don't change, do they? I mean, Thaxted is still what they would call dead, dead sheep, Tory country, right? Oh, and, oh, 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 it is. And it's still and, very, very odd. Um, and the Diocese of Chelmsford is still run by well meaning evangelicals who are not opposed to Catholic practice, but just very confused by it. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, I remember exactly. a little gaggle of Anglo-Catholic curates would sometimes meet at one of the pubs in Thaxted, um, and we would sit outside. And it, it's, you know, those of you who've seen Midsummer Murders, it's kind of like that, right? <laughs> These very odd eccentric villages. And I remember the Morris dances. Oh, yes. Um, I had never seen Morris dancing quite like that before. Um, could you just say a word as well? Uh, and I'm going to remember this incorrectly, but we would talk a lot about Conrad Knoll, a little, little group of curates. Um, he was patroned or funded by an aristocrat. Oh yes, it, it was, it was uh, the Countess of Warwick. Oh. Francis, the Countess of oh. Warwick, who had been one of Edward VII's mistresses. And there are, there are two stories of, of, about that. Uh, the first is that she became a socialist uh, because she had uh, sponsored a Marie Antoinette ball. And uh, Robert Blatchford, the editor of um, a socialist newspaper called The Clarion, had written a rather stinging editorial denouncing her. And she had responded by saying, well, think of all the work I'm giving to seamstresses. <laughs> and um, Blatchford said, well, come and see me. And after a long chat, she became a convinced socialist. The other story is this. Her nickname was Daisy. And a song was written about her called Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer to. I'm half crazy, all for the love of you. A bicycle built for two was dedicated to Conrad Knoll's patron, the Countess of Warwick. <laughs> and of course, Noel himself, I mean, one of the things about Noel, which he shared with Stuart Hedlund, um, this was not true of Thomas Hancock, but certainly true of Stuart Hedlund. Um, Noel came from wealth. Uh -huh. Noel's grandfather was the Earl of Gainsborough. His father, Roden Noel, had been a um, groom of the privy chamber for uh, Queen Victoria. And his mother had been a lady in waiting. Uh, Roden Noel, Conrad's father, um, had uh, written a, a poem rather famous called The Red Flag, later left royal service. But Conrad Noel uh, remembered that although his father had by that time become something of a socialist, he never lost his reverence for Queen Victoria. 
that his childhood was filled with endless, endless um, tales of the virtues, the virtues of the wonderful queen. And, and the, this, there is a Thomas Hancock little bit that comes into, into play here. Noel was able to take Thaxted because the Countess of Warwick owned the living. Uh, she, by the way, expected him not to be there. She thought this would be a way for him to make money. And then he'd go around doing his socialist propaganda. Uh, but Noel had a very different idea of it. Now, Thomas Hancock was offered a living by none other than Viscount Halifax, one of the most prominent Anglo-Catholic laymen. And he would not take it because he said, I will not take a living from a patron. The only church that I will ever serve in is a church that is owned by the people. Huh. Um, and uh, sort of a sad note here, you know, he ended up at St. Nicholas Cole Abbey. St. Nicholas Cole Abbey is now a, a hotbed of very, very conservative evangelicalism. Huh. Oh, too bad. So uh, how these things happen, I'm not entirely sure. And I don't know if this is still the case, John, but certainly when I was in the diocese, the church in Thaxted was dead set against the ordination of women. Yes, there was. It's a, there's a very strange story here, and I, I've tried to follow it, and what I'm going to tell you is probably not true, um, but it sounds, sounds good. Um, you know, uh, I had a student uh, several, several years ago who um, I asked the students to uh, write an essay on the Glorious Revolution. And she wrote an essay in which James II was the king of France and was a devout Protestant and on and on. It went every, and then everything was wrong. I said, the whole thing is wrong. And I call, you know, she came into my office and I said, you know that this is all wrong. And she nodded her head. And I said, but you wrote so much of it. And she said, well, she said, I knew it was wrong, but it sounded so good, I couldn't stop writing. <laughs> uh, so what follows is, I don't know. When Father Jack left, again, again, the parish council asked for someone in the same tradition. And they got someone uh, who was uh, notable for his advocacy of um, um, the church, church um, accepting um, the ordination of um, gays. And Potterill was quite upset about this. Uh, um, he was very old fashioned when it came to such things. But this new vicar, so progressive on that issue, was dead set against the ordination of women. Mm. And when I'm told, because I, I remember speaking to Andrew Sloan about this, when the parish made that pilgrimage to Walsingham and made a stop at Thaxted, it was a forward and faith parish. Mm -hmm. But now, visit visit the Thaxted uh, Parish website. And it's now part of a sort of a team ministry. And there are now women there, ordained women. So um, things have moved. When we were there, um, um, it was, I mean, one of the charming things about Thaxted, and I've been thinking a great deal about this in part ever since Christopher's talk, um, the genius, I think, of Noel and of Hedlum and Hancock and others like them is that instead of turning on the past, as some people on the left do, they embraced the past and reinterpreted it. So when we were in Thaxit, there was this Bolshevik, <laughs> this Bolshevik vicar. But when you entered the church, 
There were no prayer books. There were no leaflets. The service was laminated on wooden boards. And the service was a kind of a, a, a mishmash of 1662, 1549, and all sorts of other devotions. And I remember, you know, uh, uh, Father, when, when you talked about going to one of the pubs, we stayed at the Swan Inn, just across from the church. And we asked, we went, we went downstairs, we were speaking to the guy at the bar, and I said, what do you think about Father Jack? I, I mean, what do you think about your, your communist vicar? And he said, oh, he said, Father Jack, he said, he's a nice enough fellow. He said, a bit old fashioned. <laughs> so, so, so uh, as far as I know, women are now um, serving um, at, at Thaxted. And this brings us back to that point. There is an element of Anglo-Catholic tradition that we're missing. Um, and it is the way in which from the very beginning, from the time of the Tractarians, um, there was something that was subversive of conventional gender roles. And there's a wonderful cartoon, wonderful cartoon published probably in the 1850s or early 1860s, making fun of Anglo-Catholics. And it shows a pious Anglo-Catholic clergyman dressed, of course, in his cassock, in his skirt, looking aghast as his wife and daughters pass by in their cassocks, their skirts, swinging thuribles, preparing, obviously, to lead to celebrate a mass. There is this strange side, strange, unacknowledged, um, not studied well enough, uh, but no worth, well worth knowing about. There are treasures untold that we possess. Um, and um, I think it would do us well to open them up and not to be so defensive um, about our heritage or our legacy. That's a great, that's a great point to, to finish it, I think. Um, thank you, John. Um, I first heard of Conrad Knoll when I was at <clears throat> St. Stephen's house. Um, and it's wonderful to have a Thaxted following even in DC. And as I say, hopefully one day we'll get there. Um, that would be fun. And I'm really happy to hear that some of you have already been because I did not expect to, 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 to learn that. Sylvia, have you been to Thaxted? Yeah, I thought you may have done. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, I must, I have to add something. When we were there going to Walsingham, the poor priest was raising money to repair the roof. So I guess those death, what was the name of the insects? The death? Oh, the death watch beetle. The death watch beetle must have gotten in the roof again. Oh, oh I must, I must, before you go, um, let's see if I can get this. Hold on. Hmm. You know, English clergy dread those beetles. Um, the, the, it, it causes havoc and it is hugely expensive. The other thing they dread are bats. If you have bats in the belfry, there are certain <laughs> kinds you can get rid of and there are certain kinds you can't get rid of because they're protected species. So if you have the bats, the diocese has a special committee that will come out and they will evaluate what kind of bats you have in your church and they tell you whether you can get rid of them or not. Oh, I don't like they that. Say that you can't get rid of them. You have a nightmare waiting for you. A uh, sense that bats are that much of an issue that they have a full committee. <laughs> there is a, there there are diocesan and bat committees that that will come and, and assess what's happening. Now, Nancy, you 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 mentioned the repair. I happen to have 
a, a, a Thaxted um, um, frame devoted, framed, frame devoted to things from Thaxted. And you'll notice on the right, <laughs> Thaxted Church. This is a hymn composed by Father Jack. Oh. And the hymn, the hymn has as one of its verse, well, it reads, this friendly house of prayer was built for praise of him who gave to man his equal son in him to see the vision of the race and build the world of God's fraternity. But now this house of prayer built fair in earlier days is worn and marred by slow decay. Will none now care this dream to spare and save for endless years of worship, dance, and praise? And Jeffrey tells me that the voluntary he'll be playing, not sure at the beginning or at the end of the service, is going to be based on this tune. Oh, hmm. how nice. Um, he will improvise. Too much. Yes. Well, two million pounds this priest had to raise, and he was so thrilled we were taking him to the pub to have some wine oh. and <laughs> lunch. <laughs> so it was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, and thank you, John. I knew I was going thank to do this tonight. Um, Next week, we have a little break from Zoom as we have All Saints and All Souls. We have three, three solemn masses over three consecutive days, so we're going to be kept busy. Um, two weeks today, we start our next formation series, and that will be with Ian Vauxhall, and that will be five weeks, taking a break over Thanksgiving week, and Ian is going to be doing a 101 on the life of St. Paul. Oh, which mm -hmm. I think is going to be really interesting. He sent me some of the information already, and it looks to be really quite fascinating. Wonderful. And it's good to learn about St. Peter. Um, so thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Uh, one day we'll get to Thaxted again, and have a great night. God bless you. Mm -hmm.